Olga, would you mind starting us out with just a short opening prayer? Sure, I'd be happy to. Father, I thank you for this uh, night tonight, a special night. And Lord, we just give you this call. We give you this class tonight. And we just uh, pray and believe that Skype will work as it's supposed to work. And Father, I just ask for um, your special blessings on everybody here. And um, we just give you praise for what's going to happen on here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So if there's any kind of problem with the sound quality, somebody unmute and let me know because I'm going to be looking at a different screen where I've got some notes jotted down. So uh, just an introduction for tonight's class. Um, you know, we understand that not everybody embraces the theology of Christians raising the dead. You know, this is a class that's not so much geared toward trying to get everyone on the same page. Our target audience is not so much those who still need convincing, but for tonight's event, our focus is going to be more so on those who are already convinced. So during this class, we're going to be hearing some incredible testimonies from those who have actually raised the dead, and not just those who have a book knowledge of it or a theological knowledge of it or a theoretical knowledge of it. Um, so we're going to be talking to people who have, you know, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. And, um, you know, we're just believing that as we continue to offer this class again and again, uh, we're going to have lots of different spe speakers be able to step up to the plate and share their testimonies. Um, so the recording for tonight, we don't typically record our classes because, you know, we like to keep our class sizes fairly small. And in doing so, we're able to spend a lot of one on one time with our students, really get to know them, help them out, help them get activated in different things. And um, but tonight's a little bit different. We are going to be recording the audio. So if that makes you uncomfortable, um, you know, you can feel free to drop off and um, all of our classes, all of our training at Inside Out Training and Equipping School is totally free. We don't charge for anything. Uh, we want to make sure that we're making it accessible to everyone that would run with it. Uh, we do have a voluntary donation button on our website that we steer, to steer people toward if they you know, want to make a donation. But tonight, we want, to, we want you to forgo that. We don't want you to send us anything. In fact, um, we have a lot of different speakers here tonight, and uh, you know, they have some incredible ministries. Some of them are authors. They've written books. No. So um, we're going to provide some links to their websites uh, so you can just get some different information about them. Lots of them have YouTube channels. So, you know, if you feel inclined to donate something, we want you to just bless our speakers tonight. There's at least one person who's not muted. I'm here. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead and just mute your mic. So real quick, uh, I don't want to eat up a bunch of time tonight, but there are a few topics that I want to touch on just briefly before we start to you know, hear from our speakers. Uh, real quick, I want to talk real, about why we don't see the dead raised as much in the United States. Uh, you know, that's a question that people sometimes ask, you know, because we hear testimonies, a lot of overseas testimonies, but it's not something that you hear about on a regular basis here in the States. Um, you know, in our American culture, we have what might be considered sort of a protocol for what to do when someone dies. And honestly, there's no part of that standard protocol that really even makes room for dead raising. In fact, you know, even just the suggestion of such a thing would be thought of as taboo, even in the vast majority of families, Christian, non-Christian, and everything else in between. Uh, you know, when Uncle Bob dies, what do you do? We call the doctor, we call the EMT, we call the coroner, you know, we call the morgue, but under no circumstances whatsoever do we usually typically call on Jesus. If someone dies, for the most part, you know, we look at that as final. After death has happened, uh, a lot of times we don't take any extra steps. And that's generally uh, the point in time when all ministry attempts sort of come to a close. We chalk it up as a loss and we start planning for a funeral. And that's unfortunate because we know that we don't have to go in that direction. So, you know, raising the dead, it's not really on the grid of the average believer. 
you know, in an, in an average congregation, dead raising is something that's not really even talked about, let alone encouraged. Uh, instead, you know, just the mere notion is considered too taboo, too super spiritual, too charismatic, too whatever else you want to call it. And there's no way that most believers would ever identify themselves in that role, even though the scripture says, why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? But we don't see it that way. We don't see it as something that, you know, Joe, the guy on the third pew back from the left, we don't see it as something that he could ever do. We don't see it as something that we could do or they could do or I could do. And that mindset needs to shift. That mindset needs to change. This is not something that's reserved for the Smith Wigglesworths. This is not something that's reserved for the John G. Lakes. Um, you know, we see it as something that only ever happens somewhere off in some remote little village, somewhere in a distant part of the world where it's Hi probably... Guys. Hey, go ahead and mute your mic, Nancy. Somewhere where it's not going to be confirmed or maybe even taken seriously. So, you know, that's the kind of mindset that cripples us from being able to, to do the things that Jesus did, even though he himself said, you know, most assuredly... I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. You know, another stumbling block is that, you know, most believers just can't get past the fear of raising the dead. You know, what if it doesn't work? What if we end up looking ridiculous? How many times have we been backed, to, backed into a corner with those what if questions? How many times have we been shut down and paralyzed and made an invalid by those questions. Probably more times than you and I were, would. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead and mute your mic. Just click on the icon that looks like no a microphone. No sound. Yes, go ahead and mute your microphone. You're good, I hear you. <laughs> okay, all right. So how many times, I'm, and I'm sure that most, if not all of you, can relate to some of these things. How many times have we given someone a prophetic word and, and you know, been blasted by the what ifs? How many times have we went to minister healing to someone, but then those what if questions caused us to recoil and retreat and draw back and not take hold of that opportunity? You know, the enemy loves to put those questions in our thoughts. And if, if we're someone who's never been blasted with those kind of thoughts, then it's probably because we're not challenging ourselves. If we're not a regular target of the, of the what if questions, it's probably because we're stagnant and we're not stepping out and we're not stretching ourselves. We can't stretch ourselves and challenge ourselves without formally being introduced to the what if questions. In fact, they won't even wait for a formal introduction. They'll step right up in our face and say, well, 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 you know, who do we have here? It looks like another Christian coming to test their superpowers. Well, allow me to introduce myself. My name is What If, and I'm here to make sure that you fail. I'm here to devour you. So just get that silly little thought right out of your head that you're about to do something miraculous because guess what? I've contended with much more formidable opponents than you. And guess what? Guess where they are. They're right back in the pew, right where I want them. They're audience members all over again because they were no match for me. They loved their comfort zones. They loved not being challenged. They loved their safety net. They loved watching others step out and hearing the testimony of others more than they loved the reality that those same testimonies could have been their own. I apologize. <laughs> My son just got home, so I've got to unlock the door for him. Teenagers. <laughs> One second. Okay, I'm on a call, so. All right. Let me get situated. One second. This is what happens when you have a house with kids. <laughs> All right, so, um, you know, too many times believers become satisfied 
with a lesser Christian experience. They become satisfied with watching other people do things that they wish that they were doing. So, you know, let me just say this, and I'm going to say it slowly, and I want you to really saturate what I'm about to say. Satisfaction is the death of destiny. I'll say it again. Satisfaction is the death of destiny. You know, God didn't create us to be satisfied. He created us to be audacious. And audacity, that's a good thing. Audacity says and does what's not safe. Audacity steps out into the arena of fear and tramples all over its neck. And that's what God's called us to do. He's called us to be those bold and courageous, faith-filled believers that are really ready to step into that ring. So really quick, I want to talk to you just briefly about boldness to raise the dead. And um, let me just say this. I'm speaking as someone who has never raised the dead. It's not that I haven't tried. I've stepped in that arena two or three times now, and I haven't seen it yet. But I am determined that I'm going to see it. Um, so I want to talk to you about boldness for a minute because boldness is definitely something that would be relevant to raising the dead. So listen closely. Don't wait for a feeling of boldness to come upon you. If you wait for a feeling of boldness to overtake you, then you're probably going to be waiting for a feeling that may or may not come. Boldness is not a feeling. It's, it's a doing. If you wait until you're bold enough to do that thing that God's challenging you to do, then nine times out of ten, you're never going to do it. If you wait for the right timing, you're never going to do it. If you wait for the planets to be in alignment and the winds to be blowing in the right direction and everything to be just perfect, then guess what? Your day is going to come and go with or without you. You're going to miss the train that was just about to carry you off into the next level of your supernatural experience with God. And that season will come and go with or without you. That's why the Bible says to be instant, in season and out of season. Be bold when you're ready and be bold when you're not ready. You see, boldness, it's something that you take. It's something, it's not something that's handed over to us. It's not something that's served up to us on a silver platter. We take it. The situation presents itself and we don't entertain those what if questions. We silence them. The situation presents itself and we peel off our comfort zone. We peel off our dig dignity and we check those things at the door because we've got work to do. Soldiers don't ask why. They just obey orders. Soldiers just get in there and get the job done. They just get in there and they make it happen. So we respond to dead raising because we're soldiers. We've been called, we've been commissioned to respond to a direct order to raise the dead. Jesus said, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead. And so our comfort zone is completely irrelevant. Our dignity, it's not even part of the equation. There's no time for dignity when we're on the front lines. We're not checking to see if every hair is in place. We're not checking to see who's looking and who's not looking. We're not checking to see if we have the appropriate church title. We're not checking to see whose theology lines up with ours. Boldness doesn't rise up. It has to be reached for. It has to be grabbed and taken by force. We have to put ourselves in situations where we reach out and we grab it and we say, you know what? I don't have this kind of boldness right now, so I'm taking it. I'm taking it by force. The Bible says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, but the violent take it by force. So dead raisers don't become dead raisers because they played it safe. They don't become dead raisers because they waited for everybody's theology to get on the same page with theirs. They become dead raisers by taking it by force. Ecclesiastes 11.4, it says, He who observes the wind will not sow, and he who regards the clouds will not reap. So again, um, you know, people would ask the question, well, 
what do I do if I try and I fail? Well, guess what? If you minister life to someone who's died and they're not raised up, do you know what's going to happen? The sun's still going to rise. The stars are still going to give their light. The moon is still going to come out at night. And that might not be very much relief to you or to the family members of that person who's gone. But guess what? If this was your first attempt, don't let it be your last. Every time we do something and we don't see the outcome that we're looking for, it gives us another opportunity to go back in more motivated, more determined, more experienced. So for the most part, it's highly unlikely that we will become experienced that much of anything without having some less than favorable experiences intermingled with the ones where everything worked out just perfectly and seamlessly. It just doesn't work that way. Part of the learning process is learning from the good circumstances and also learning from the bad things, the things that didn't go right. It's highly likely that we're going to learn much more from our failed attempts than we do from the ones where everything just goes perfectly. You know, we may even want to change our terminology. There is no such thing as failure. The only failure is failing to try. Think of it this way. Even if we fall flat on our face, we're still moving forward. So having said that, uh, I want to introduce you to some men and women of God who are giving freely of their time tonight. Um, they didn't have to do this. This is not a paid gig. This is something that they're doing because they have a heart for God and they want to see you, the average everyday believer, the lady of the church right alongside the leader. They want to see you trained and equipped. And so it's not every day that we have a panel of speakers like this in front of us that we can pick their brain and ask those questions that we want to ask. So as we hear their testimonies, I want you to write down your questions. We have some sample questions that we're going to ask them because we want to maximize the time that we have with them. But if you've got some great questions, again, write them down. If we have time, we're going to come back and have a question and answer session at the end. So uh, let me introduce um, Dan and Sarah Homan. Uh, they were um, introduced to me by Don Lissell, and I am so excited to have them with us tonight. They are two of the believers uh, who are on our panel tonight, and we're going to be bringing them in for this class. They're a husband-wife team. Don't you love to hear that, that they're our husband and wife teams who have both raised the dead. They're founders of Brick City Christian Church. Um, Dan is going to share his testimony. I, I don't want to, I don't want to share too much because I want him to be able to share it. But um, both he and Sarah have raised the dead multiple times. Dan died. He was raised. Uh, they currently have two um, two Facebook pages: Brick City Christian Church and Ocala Victorious Overcomers. Um, they are, you know, major players with that. Uh, with that ministry. And uh, before they share their dead raising testimony, I want them to just briefly talk about their ministry. And at the end, I'm going to make sure that you get links to stay in touch with all of these different people. When we send out the audio link, we're also going to be sending out links so that you can stay in touch with them, look up their YouTube channels, their Facebook pages, their websites, whatever they have available. So um, Dan and Sarah, I'm just going to mute my microphone and I'm going to have you guys just jump in there and, and just talk to us for a while you go <laughs> <laughs> well, well Cheryl I, I just want to say one thing that really um, really blessed me when you were sharing there is um, what you were saying about boldness and and really that's the key um, a lot of times when you're in a situation where you're you know you're raising the dead even if you, it's just a little sickness or something like that that's uh, coming on you you have to push through that boldness, you know, push through that fear that comes at you and override it with boldness. And and I know um, when I raised Dan from the dead that that's – I remember distinctly that moment of of zing, of, of fear trying to come at me. It was just like a split second and I was like, no, and I just pushed through it. So um, we're not going to share our testimony just yet fully, but um, I'm going to let Dan talk real quick. Okay, yeah, I just want to say, 
pay all and uh, you know we're doing great things here in Florida that's about it okay no you guys can go ahead go ahead and jump in there and share your share the testimonies we want to hear that stuff all right well <laughs> uh, um, first first I'll say um, our, our first experience with uh, raising the dead was and it was Dan that raised um, our daughter from the dead. She was uh, stillborn, and I remember um, it was it was a really trying situation. Anyway, she was born and she was lying at my feet, and I remember because I couldn't open my eyes all during labor, and um, I looked down and I saw her, and she was she was gray blue, um, and that split second that I looked at her, the Lord spoke to me and said, "Don't look at death." So I closed my eyes and I, you know, I didn't, you know, when you're in that situation, you t time just goes like crazy. Anyway, um, I had some challenges. What they did is they took the baby, whisked her away, put her in a, um, a, um, bassinet and covered her over with a towel or a blanket or what I think it was a towel. And, um, and then I'm going to let Dan share the rest on that one. Cause he's the one that did their dead raising there. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so they put her in the other room behind a curtain because Sarah had challenges. They were shorthanded. And, well, um, in the midst of it all, I realized what happened to my daughter. And I went in there and I saw her body in the little bassinet with the uh, towel over the top. I knew they were, because it was behind the curtain, I knew they were going to come back. And get her after all the challenges with Sarah were done. But I knew that also that she shouldn't be in there like that. She should be alive and breathing and smiling and all that. And I, I just pulled the towel off and I picked her up and I just held her. And I said, Bethany, you're such a precious little girl. And your big sister is coming tomorrow to see you. And she can't see you like this. You need to wake up now in Jesus' name. And I must have said it, wow, for, for maybe 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, she coughed. When she coughed, all of a sudden, all the people left Sarah. And they came in by me and pushed me aside. And, uh, took the baby. <laughs> yeah, I took the baby. But, you know, she just had her 28th birthday. So, I mean, that was how we got started with this and really we've seen others raised since and it's really been an amazing time in fact I was raised from the dead too uh, why don't you share that Sarah okay um, when when um, I guess it's it's almost three years now uh, it was January 10th um, I guess that would make it 2012 no 2013 um, anyway um one morning I went in the, in the bedroom and Dan was, uh, he was lying in the bed. He's he doesn't sleep longer than I do most of the time. And, um, so I let him sleep, came back a little while later and he was sprawled all over the bathroom floor. Um, and then, so I waited a few minutes, came back in, he finally got himself back into bed and I just figured it was like a flu or something like that. And I just laid my hands on him and, and really unemotional in the whole thing, just laid my hands on him, took authority over that whole thing and walked out. Well, for the next three days, he didn't talk to me. He didn't, um, he didn't function even like somebody that, that had the flu. He just, you know, was in another world. Um, he did go to work the first day, which was really, really amazing. Um, he drove a half an hour to work, half hour back, couldn't get the computer on. So, so he left work anyway. Um, so by the third day I could see that he wasn't taking in any fluids and, wasn't putting out any fluids. So I, I thought I'd just take him down to the hospital. But when I got him down to the hospital, I mean, he was a mess. Um, so, um, what I did was, um, the, they took his blood pressure. His blood pressure was 235 over 110. His blood sugar was 193 after not eating for three days. And that's, that's super, super high. Both of them are. Um, when they asked him the questions, uh, you know, he knew his birth date. He knew his name. 
Um, but Ronald Reagan was the president and it was 1998. So I knew something was really wrong there. They did a CAT scan and they, they found that he had a massive brain hemorrhage. Well, uh, the doctor came in and, you know, told me that they were going to ship him off to one hospital, ship him off to another hospital. Um, and, uh, they were going to do brain surgery at both hospitals. And then the nurse said to me after, you know, as soon as the doctor left, she said, Mrs. Holman, how long has your husband been in this state? And I said, well, he's been like this for three days. And she looked at me, you know, kind of looked down her nose and she said, um, Mrs. Holman, you don't have three days with a massive brain hemorrhage. You might have three hours before they're gone. So how long was it, Mrs. Holman? And I said, well, it's been three days. And she, you know, she proceeded to tell me that he had blood all on the side of his head, you know, on the side, in his brain and down into his spinal fluid and, and that he wasn't going to last the night. So when she said those words, that was kind of when I was zinged. And I said, oh, no. I said, my husband will live. And I put my hand on his forehead. And I said, I said, my husband will live and not die in the name of Jesus. With a long life, he'll be satisfied. And I just kept going on and on with scriptures. But at that particular time, I did not know that my husband was not in his body. So you see, it doesn't matter whether we know that they're really dead or what their situation is. It matters that we speak the word. It matters that we agree with God. So um, he heard those words and knew that I would be in agreement with him and that I would stand with him because he knew he wasn't capable of standing by himself. But, you know, in the spirit realm, you think, oh, you know, they don't, they don't hear. No, they hear. They hear completely. And I'm just going to have Dan share that part with you. Yeah, that's really important, too, because, I mean, I was out of it for, for a period of time, a good period of time. But mentally, I was, you know, this is afterwards. Mentally, I was still with it. No, I was out of it. But spiritually, I was with it. And there were a couple times I couldn't even put two or three words together to make sense. But twice I prophesied for a good five or ten minutes. Because, you see, there's a difference between your mind and your spirit. And my spirit was still connected to God. And that's something that we really need to realize. Even if machines say a person is brain dead, you know, the, body, you know, the Bible says that the body without the spirit is dead. And if they're laying there and they're still, they've still got breath in their lungs and their heart's still beating, then they're not necessarily dead. And so that's something very important to remember about people and, and that there's always hope and this spirit man always hears. But anyway, that's what I wanted to share. I'll let Sarah do the talking, though. <laughs> All right. I, I just want to share one one more thing here. I mean, we have other testimonies, but I don't want to go into that, and I want to give other people a chance. But um, years ago, I would say it's about maybe 15, 20 years ago, there was a gentleman that was in the church that we were a part of. And he was, he was a relatively young man. He was 41 years old, and he was dying of cancer. And um, a friend of mine who was uh, – really on fire for God. Her name was Marie. And she saw, um, she asked me to take her to the hospital to, to see this guy. Um, cause she wanted to raise him from the dead. She wanted to raise him, not raise him from the dead, but raise him from his deathbed. And, uh, I remember, and this is, this is really, really key. Your words in a crucial situation mean everything. And, um, I remember her, her sitting by his bed and he was unconscious and she said to me, Sarah, I want to lay hands on him and raise him up. And I told her, I said, you know what, Marie? I said, he made his decisions and he's going to die. And we left the hospital. You know, I told her, I said, come on, let's go. So we left the hospital and um, within an hour he was dead. And that rattled my cage when I, I, I realized, 
you know, I, I kind of surmised, I didn't fully realize it. I realize it more so now, but my words had an impact on that man departing from this earth. And that really bothered me. So I would encourage everybody to watch what you say. Speak life. Yes. Yeah, speak life. Just if, if you can't speak life, shut up. But you know, get the words of truth out there so that the person has a chance to live and not die. Wow, that was phenomenal. Uh, go ahead and mute your mic for just a second. I want to thank you for being so transparent. Thank you for sharing those amazing testimonies. That was a lot of really great information for those of us who are, you know, walking in this journey and maybe haven't really experienced uh, a resurrection yet. Um, that was some great information. So um, again, for those of you who are listening on the call tonight, I want to encourage you write down those questions because you know there were a lot of people that wanted to be on the call tonight, and so we want to honor you know them by answering by asking the questions that they probably would have had. So uh, I'm going to bring up another speaker right now. We've got uh, let's see. Let me see. We've got Frank Hanks. Uh, he's from Empty Hospitals International. He's also the author of some different books, um, God's Method for His Children to Be Miracle Workers, uh, Body Parts, and the interestingly titled book, How to Get Kicked Out of Church. <laughs> so I love that. So we're going to bring Frank on, and he's going to share some of his testimonies. And uh, so, Frank, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and just mute my microphone and let you step up to plate. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Well, here we go. Um, I uh, started being interested in raising the dead by listening to a few people teach on it. Uh, and then I thought to myself, you know, for a while, that, boy, I sure would like to have an opportunity to try to raise somebody from the dead. But because our society in North America is like Cheryl said it was, that there's all this protocol that people get whisked off to the funeral home or whatever right away, and nobody really has raising them from the dead on the radar. So it was frustrating to me. So what I decided to do, I heard a testimony about Tyler uh, G. Johnson, who uh, was the only person in uh, the state of Washington, I believe, to get a first responder's badge from the government as a dead razor. And so he would show up at accident scenes and uh, he would uh, try to get close to a person so he could raise them from the dead. And he he kind of developed a reputation. This is the guy that just showed up at the accidents. And uh, one day a governor or somebody high up in the government said to him, he says, oh, you're the guy that shows up to raise dead at the accident, aren't you? And he goes, uh, well, yeah. And he says, well, how would you like to do it in an official capacity? So he uh, developed a category for dead raisers as first responders. And I thought, man, that's brilliant. And he, uh, he goes around the world teaching on raising the dead. And uh, he uh, has dead raising teams and he develops these teams. I'm uh, the captain of one of the teams in Alberta. And so if there's a, a desire for somebody to be raised from the dead, they contact us and see if we'd be willing. Uh, so far, it hasn't happened, but we're in the ready. And so what I did, just to keep the ministry of raising the dead before my eyes, I started a Facebook group called uh, The Dead Raising Team, and it created a, um, an, an environment for believers uh, to come together and share their mutual faith in raising the dead, and also talk about our successes and even some of our failures. And what it has really helped us to do is to stay committed to the calling, number one. And two, it keeps the ministry before our eyes and our hearts. And so we're always thinking about it. We're dreaming about it. We're prophesying about it. We're uh, praying about it. And the third thing that happens is we inspire each other to go and create opportunities to raise the dead. 
Now that's what happened to me. I was uh, I I uh, was committed to the calling. First of all, I kept my eyes uh, and my heart on the ministry of raising dead. And then I said, you know, enough talk. I'm going to go create opportunities. So in night in uh, 2013, I uh, uh, took a trip to Africa and Malaysia and I, uh, South Africa, Malaysia, and Nigeria, and I called it the Empty Morgue World Tour. And so uh, I made some T-shirts and took them with me, and off to Africa I went. I wound up in Nigeria uh, on my second leg of the trip and asked to go into a morgue at a Catholic hospital. Well, uh, the pastor that I asked to call them, he called them and they said, no, absolutely not, you can't come. And so the pastor gave the message to me and I said, let's go anyway. And he goes, what? I said, yeah, let's go anyway. I came to raise the dead, so we're going to go. And so uh, off to the morgue we went and we uh, had a conversation or two with the guy who was kind of keeping the morgue. And uh, so uh, finally they said, okay, go ahead. And so they led us into the morgue and there were two dead people in there. Uh, I prayed for a lady who had been dead for a whole month. Nothing happened. Uh, there was another man there. We prayed for him. Nothing happened. So we walked away in my very first encounter unsuccessful. But the thing that I know about being faithful is that in the beginning stages of anything you do, you're probably going to have more failures than successes. So I kind of took that uh, under advisement and I said, well, no, ju just because I failed the first time, I'm not going to stop trying. And so uh, in Malaysia, on that very same trip, I wound up uh, going into a hospital morgue and praying for a Chinese woman who had been thrown out of the car at, high, at a high rate of speed and broke her head open. And uh, nothing happened there. And so I went home after that trip and uh, didn't have any successes. But two months later, I found myself in India and I was preaching at a church and teaching people uh, how to heal. And there was a lot of young people that were really interested in the message. And rather than me do all the preaching and all the healing, I got the people to heal one another. And so we had just a real fun time with that. And uh, in the last meeting, uh, a lady came in and through an interpreter, uh, she was pregnant at about five months, I think it was. And the baby, uh, there was no activity in the womb for the past two weeks. Uh, they told her two weeks ago that the baby was dead and that she needed to set up an appointment to come and have the baby removed from her body uh, because I guess it would uh, become very toxic and even kill the woman. So anyway, uh, uh, so the baby had been two, uh, two weeks dead, no heartbeat. And so that was the situation. And I thought to myself, well, uh, I'm training people, so I might as well train these girls how to, how to raise the dead. And so I took the girls over there and I said, now, uh, let's look at the situation. The babies had no pulse and no heartbeat for two weeks. So there must be something wrong with the heart. What do you say we ask God for a brand new heart for this baby? And the little girls will go, yeah, yeah, let's pray for that. And so these uh, beautiful Indian girls laid hands on the baby and they started praying that God would put a new heart in the baby. And then we started commanding uh, the womb uh, to be a place where life is. And we started commanding her body to carry the baby to full term. So I looked at the, I looked at the girls praying and I looked at the woman and it looked like she just had this utter despair and hopelessness on her on her heart and so I started praying for her heart that God would heal her heart and restore her hope and all this kind of stuff and uh, after praying for about five minutes all of a sudden there's this bright glow came upon the lady and she started smiling real big and I thought well hey 
we we did something good for the lady. Now she's not so uh, broken hearted or hopeless or grieving. What I didn't know at that moment was that's when the baby started kicking. So the girls who were praying for uh, the baby to get a new heart, all of a sudden the baby starts kicking against their hands. And that's when the lady uh, really cheered up. And so uh, I, I realized now that I've prayed for four people to come back from the dead, one of them has. So one out. Of, so that's 25%. I, my odds can only get better and better. And uh, so I'm really thankful that there's so many people uh, waking to the ministry of raising the dead. One thing I want to say before I stop is that we've had uh, great revivals in the past. We've had revivals where the Holy Spirit uh, kind of hit the earth again back in Azusa Street and around that uh, same 20 years, there was a lot of manifestations of people getting filled with the Holy Ghost. There's a great healing revival uh, that began after World War II where people were just getting healed by the thousands. And these are ministries that weren't very prevalent when these manifestations begin to happen. So what I'm looking, and I look at the Bible in 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verse 26, and it says the last enemy uh, that shall be destroyed is death. And I think to myself, well, we've had healing revivals. We've had uh, revivals of, of uh, salvation through faith, and we've had revivals of uh, the Holy Spirit being poured out. Well, the long overdue revival, in my opinion, is the revival of raising the dead. I believe it's exploding. I believe that it's going to be heard of more and more, and it's going to be more and more common until the attitudes change and until there's more people out there believing that they can raise the dead. Amen. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Frank, and thank you for building a community of like-minded believers. Thank you for giving them a place to go where they can speak freely and openly about these things, and thank you for teaching us about perseverance for a breakthrough. It's just like we always say it inside out, whatever you keep moving closer to, that's what you're going to get closer to. So thank you. I appreciate you so much. Um, I'm going to have another set of speakers come up. I'm going to bring up Dave and Patty Loggy. Uh, Dave and Patty are itinerant evangelists. Uh, they travel both nationally and internationally, equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. They're founders of Holy Spirit-led ministries. Uh, Dave and Patty are both extremely effective at ministering healing and helping other people to get up and running with that. Uh, they have a great success rate with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They've got an astounding track record record of salvations and an unlimited supply of miraculous testimonies that will literally knock you off your rocker. So um, I'm going to go ahead and mute my mic and Dave and Patty, it's all yours. Well, hi there. Thank you for having us on. We love uh, sharing our testimonies and just encouraging other believers to lay hands on the sick and watch them recover, but also raise the dead. Um, Dave started doing it when he was a child, and I met Dave, and we had someone that fell dead in our home. He hit his head on the floor, and his last breath came out, and he made that gurgling noise, and we just, Dave was right next to him. He laid hands on him and just spoke life into him, and I was a few feet away, and both started speaking life into him, and it took probably about 10 minutes. And there was other people in the room that were speaking life into him. And we just saw him all of a sudden wake up. And he started breathing again. And so, you know, God just puts us in the right place at the right time so that we can get the job done. Do you want to add to that one? Well, <clears throat> I've got unusual. I started doing it as a baby. I was four when I started raising animals from the dead. I had a praying grandmother that told me I could do like Jesus. If you lay hands on the sick or dead, God will fix them. My theology was like a child. So it wasn't until I got older that 
I got the traditions of the churches around the mainline denominations that that stuff all died and went away. And I'd had hit and miss results. And there was a lot of other testimonies in the middle of my life. But I actually died for the fourth time. I got hit by what looked like a bolt of lightning about 13 years ago. And it was, I don't want to use the word magic, but it just came back like when I was a kid. And it was like, I just knew that if I laid hands on them, God would fix them. And the other thing we've discovered is I'm I'm an old cowboy, so I don't have a lot of um, mannerisms. The guy that dropped dead in our house, they were going to baptize people. So as soon as he rose up, we didn't stop. We baptized the people. And I made him preach the next night. Kind of like getting bucked off a horse where you put your right back on him. <laughs> and people around us started picking up on it. And we had a young man here that moved from Pennsylvania. He actually raised his sister from the dead on Father's Day. So it's teachable. And if you hang around the radicals, it, it just, you, you start doing what they're doing and you don't think about it. You know, it's when we just listen. It's like I was in, going to Walgreens and I thought, oh, I'm not sure I really need to go there. Well, I, then I really felt like I had to go. It's like God was just pulling me there. And I did, and there was, I got what I needed, and a lady fell down right in front of me. She had two different seizures, and then she quit breathing. And, you know, as soon as I saw her fall down, I, I didn't think about it. My reaction was immediately to lay hands on her and to start speaking life into her, because that's just what we walk in. That's that's who we are. You know, it's just second nature. You don't think about it. You just do it. And I was just praying in tongues and just saying in Jesus' name, and God gave me the words. And I just said, breathe, breathe, breathe. And she started breathing. She came back to life, and she wanted to get up and walk off. So you know that that was God because that's not normal. And then the third one was um, at the Iowa State Fair, not this year, but last year in August, we had a prayer booth. And we had over a thousand people healed and a thousand people saved. And we were, um, it was the very last night. And at the end of the night, we were going to go home. And Lila, a friend of ours that helps at the prayer booth and helps with our ministry, said, There's one more person that we're supposed to pray for. And so this lady just falls down right in front of us. And so I don't, I even think about it. I just go over there. I just scoop her up and I'm just speaking life into her. And her family member said that she had been on a ride and she'd taken medication because she has like panic attacks and she went on a roller coaster ride or something that went upside down and she got off and she just lost it. She just like fainted. Her eyes rolled back in her head and she quit breathing. She she wasn't there anymore. And so I just spoke life into her. Lila was agreeing with me. Um, another friend of ours came up and was in agreement. And all of a sudden, she started breathing again. So it's, it's being in the right place at the right time. But it, it's also, you don't even think about it. It's just second nature. You just do it because... You're so saturated in it. That's what you walk in. That's what you talk about. We train people to to do the same thing. And just healing the sick is just it's just second nature to us. Well, the other thing is don't try to make a formula out of it because it's happened a little different. I mean, the Bible says lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Or command like our brother Frank was saying. It's speaking truth over the situation, what you want to happen, and not speaking all the negative things. It's easy to get caught up when you get a group around, and a lot of times there's a group around, somebody falls over and drops dead. The um, the the key was with me anyway was getting out of the way and just I'm I'm Jesus hands and feet. I I try to be a non entity. I mean, it might not look like that, but that's what I'm thinking inside. It ain't about me anyway. It's about the Jesus in me. And if he was here, he would get 100%. And I tend to be 
analyzing whether it worked or not. And if it didn't work, I want to know why it didn't work. Because we should be walking in 100%. Because the Bible says we should get the same results as Jesus and greater works. So I've always got the greater works as a focus point. What do I need to do to die to self? Or what tradition do we need to kill so we walk in the 100%? And I do that when we have prayer lines is I never ask where it come from or any of the details. And most of our miracles are in one word. Just It's like the I call it the bang. I'm going to release the kingdom. It's kind of like going to a track meet. I hand the baton off the Holy Ghost and just say it's finished. I go to the next person. The other key was I watched a lot of the greats of the past. I, I liked a lot of the Wigglesworth. He was radical. He wasn't that nice, but he was radical. He got results. I always wanted to see results. And I was shooting for 100%, and I couldn't find any mentors. And God spoke to heart. I want you to be one of them. Like me, who, you know, I'm just a kind of a nobody. I was a truck driver, construction worker, cowboy. And that's what he wants, people that aren't going to come from a religious setting to just be Jesus' hands and feet. And I just got, when I was listening to everybody else, it's you're just walking in the Holy Ghost mode. You just know because you're just in tune with God, and you just step into it. You don't think about it. There's times when we're, we're preaching, and it's like I just am listening to God, and the Holy Ghost takes over. And I was listening to uh, me preaching oh, a couple weeks ago, and I scared myself. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just letting the Holy Ghost take over and just doing what he wants done. You don't have to think about it. You're just that vessel that has emptied yourself, and you're willing to step into what God wants you to do. And then you see amazing results. Yeah, we've, we've had nine people that have hang, hung around with us that have raised the dead now. So it's, it's I don't want to say it's teachable, but it, if you hang around, it just kind of jumps on you and you become part of it and do it. And, and Solomon was here. You want to share a few seconds? Nope. Okay. He, he just went like he was just like a vessel and he thought it was only a few seconds and the Holy Ghost took over and it was probably five minutes. His sister was dead. And he didn't even realize it until a couple of days later that, wow, you know, it wasn't for me being on earth doing it. We'd have had a funeral instead of a testimony. We want testimonies. We don't want, we don't want non-results. And I, I take a very um, strong What's the word? That it's up to me. I, I do everything like, hey, it's up to me to get the job done. I know it comes from, the power comes from God, but it's like he handed it off to us to be a doer of the word. If we do the word, he does the rest. Amen. So we just, we have a training that we go around and teach people to, to do healing and all over the world. We'll, we'll go wherever we need to go. And we our website is hslm.us. So we've got all kinds of testimonies. And we just love doing God's work and seeing people healed. And just we've got a Facebook page for Holy Spirit Led Ministries group. And we've got testimonies. And we just want to keep doing God's work, being about our Father's business, and, and seeing people healed and set free and raised from the dead we we've tried to raise other people from the dead too we've actually had people call us and say come and the first thing when i hear somebody's died is declare because we don't have to necessarily be there we've prayed for other people over the phone when they've had a dead person then they have come back to life too in text yeah Oh, text messages. We've too. gotten text message. Somebody died, and then a short time after we get it, well, we guess they didn't die after all. They actually <laughs> come back, and they didn't realize it. So thanks for having us on. That's incredible. Thank you so much. You know, it, 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 go ahead and mute your mics for just a second. 
it's good for us to be around like-minded people who stretch our minds to the possibilities of, you know, the different um, means and avenues, whereas people have been raised up, you know, um, some of us may have never even thought in that direction before. So I appreciate you, uh, you know, just sharing those kinds of testimonies. Dave, your, your own life is just uh, incredible. You know, you've been resurrected four times, uh, you know, when you were little, stung by bees, and, um, and your spirit left your body. And then I think you had told me struck by lightning twice. And then what was the last one? Was it uh, you were hit by a, a, a truck or something? Remind me. I made national news and I made national news on a truck wreck. And I, I didn't even realize that I was floating above watching them work on me. They took me to the hospital and before morning I walked out. Yeah, absolutely. yeah, absolutely. All right, go ahead and mute your mics. So, um, yeah, not just dead raising, but also resurrection. So it's great to hear those kinds of things. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We had one speaker that wasn't able to make it tonight. And I just praise God for the circle of influence that he's put around me because I was thinking, okay, who am I going to get to fill their spot? And we actually have two people here tonight that have raised the dead who weren't even on the lineup tonight. We've got Don. Uh, is it Don Lissell or Lyle? I, I can never remember which way you pronounce that, Don. Well, my parents called it Lyle, so I'm going to continue with that. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we've got Don Lyle. Uh, he's with John G. Lake Min Ministries. Um, and he's got an amazing dead raising testimony. And then we've also got Pena DePena. Uh, she's one of our alumni trainers from Inside Out Training and Equipping School. And she's got some phenomenal testimonies as well. Uh, we've still, we're still going to hear from Jesse Berkey from um, Project Afterlife in the movie Dead Razor. Uh, Michael Dingman. You know, we've got such a great panel tonight. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull in the wild card. Pena, how about if I have you jump in there next? And, and you know, if you don't mind, um, I'd love to hear that testimony that, that you shared a while back about raising an animal from the dead that had been, I think it had been run over or something like that. You have to refresh my memory. So I'm going to mute and you just jump in there. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I like that one too because I was very aware of the Lord caring about raising the dead, uh, raising people, healing them, giving them sight, um, you know, growing new limbs. I've seen the Lord do what he says he does in the scriptures. And I had a situation where I was coming home with my boys. Um, and as we, I drove up in the driveway, one of my sons was alarmed and he said, mom, someone just ran over a cat and he's still alive and and so I I told them go ahead go in the house and I walked over to where the little critter was and as I approached him I noticed his his body was flat uh it was crushed and there was a uh, fluid oozing out of him on the asphalt and I just looked at him and I I felt terrible because the little head was still alive and his little eyes were expressing pain and my heart just went out to him. And so I did what anybody would do. I called the animal control on my cell phone and uh, they told me it was going to be about an hour before they got there. So I said I'd stay as long as I could so nobody would come and crush his little head. Um, so I stood there and as I was standing there watching him suffer, my heart of compassion started to stir. And, and I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm a woman of faith and power and I'm helpless. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do for him. And so I, I basically was uh, crying out to the Lord for guidance and I didn't know what he was going to have me do. And so I remembered uh, in our classes uh, of, of the fireballs, where we throw fireballs. And I started thinking about what can I do to help him not to have pain while he's dying? I was still thinking he's dying. And so I started like just thinking I'm going to just pray that there would be comfort 
given to him. And so as I reached out my hand toward him, I, all of a sudden I started speaking in tongues. And as I continued to speak in tongues, I started noticing that his little body, uh, which was flat, uh, you could see the the grease tire mark on his little body, and um, it started blowing up like a normal size cat, like a balloon. And and I kept speaking in tongues because words failed me in the natural. I had no idea how to pray for that. And as I continued to speak in tongues, I saw right in front of my eyes as the Lord. Uh, started to heal him and restore him. And the little cat, his little legs started twitching, his little tail started wagging. Uh, and before that had taken place, our neighbors had seen him flat. And they said that was Layla's cat, which is one of our neighbors. And they ran off to go call her. And of course, they were going to give her the bad news. And I just stood there with him and I continued to pray. And as I saw Layla coming up toward us, um, the cat stood up and walked away behind a wrought iron fence where she could not access him. And I continued to quietly pray in tongues. And she came up and asked me what happened. And I, I was like in amazement. And I briefly told her, what I just witnessed. And, and she looked at the cat and she looked at me like I was exaggerating or something, you know, people in the natural don't get it. And she said, he looks fine to me, turned around and she walked away. And I stood there in amazement of how many miracles are walking around that people don't even recognize. And, and I started to really get a hold of, of, Wherever we are, whatever circumstance, uh, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we are the sons of God that all of creation is awaiting to see, manifest. And, and I've been walking in that since that. And I've had so many other opportunities to manifest as a son of God. And I'm getting more uh, results because I've learned to engage with the word of God. I've learned to create it, that arc uh, between heaven and earth where miracles happen. Uh, Jesus said, the kingdom of God has come unto you. And he, everywhere he went, miracles went with him uh, because he was connected. He was connected with a father. And there's one scripture that really resonates in me. And I stand on it in John 1930, when Jesus was on the cross and he said, it is finished. You have to understand what he was talking about so that you can engage with him with that truth that everything that we need is done. But we tend to set our patterns after the world because if what happens in the world, if somebody dies, what do they do? They bury them or they cremate them. Well, if we keep thinking that way, we don't give place for the Lord to move because our minds are already set against him. So, I mean, there's so much more I could share, but I don't want to take up any more time. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Pena. And, you know, I really appreciate you sharing that particular testimony for, for a good reason. I think it's because, you know, a lot of us, uh, we let what we see become a deal breaker for us. You know, honestly, if I had been in that same position and seen that animal with that tire track over it and its body crushed, I don't know if that would have, uh, I'm guessing, honestly, that that may have been a deal breaker for me. I don't know if I could have stood there and you know ministered life to that animal and uh you know so when i heard you share that testimony the first time you know that kind of switched gears in my thoughts and got me thinking in a different direction so i just want to thank you for that that really blessed me so um we're going to bring Cheryl? up our next Cheryl? yes uh melissa just messaged me and uh <laughs> trying to figure out how to get her on the call here 
Okay. Um, since we do have a limited number of spaces on the call and Melissa is a speaker, what I'm going to have you do is look at the the list of people that were uh, signed up for the class and whoever was signed up last, uh, we're going to go ahead and drop them off. And I, I hate to do that, but uh, you know we need to make sure we get the speakers added. So I apologize, and we again we will make the link available to uh, to everyone. So you know even if we have to remove someone tonight, you you'll have the link. We'll make sure that we get that in your hands. Okay, I'll go look. Okay, so um, I'm going to go ahead and bring Jesse Berkey in as our next speaker. Jesse, uh, he lives in Tampa, Florida with his wife and family uh, in, in Tampa Bay area uh, where he works as a firefighter, paramedic. Um, many of you will probably remember Jesse from the Christian movie Dead Razor. Uh, he's also one of the team members of the new television show Project Afterlife. If you haven't seen that show, check it out. I love that show. My kids love that show. They t they they uh, interview people and uh, you know find about find out about their resurrection testimonies and and the story behind the story. And he also has recently started up a newer ministry called Vim V I M. It stands for Virtual Interactive Ministry. Uh, he's an author, a blogger, and he loves to do marketplace ministry. So again, when we send out that link, we're going to make sure that we have websites, YouTube channels, all that kind of stuff so that you can stay in touch with all of our speakers. Uh, without further ado, Jesse, I'm going to mute my mic and you can jump on in here. All right. Thank you so much, Cheryl. It's such a pleasure to be here. It's such an honor um, to speak with you guys. And what an amazing panel of, of uh, speakers and audience members, people just chasing, pursuing the heart of God and just seeing what he has in store for us. But um, I guess I just got to say, I wasn't I wasn't looking for any of this. Dead, I'll just jump right into it. <laughs> I wasn't looking for any of this, of this dead raising uh, stuff. This was stuff that was off my grid. Let's see. Back in 2007, at the end of 2007, I had just kind of come out of, I don't want to sound too cliche, but a dark night of the soul, if you will. Uh, at the end of 2007, I had a pretty dramatic encounter with the Lord in the back of my Chevy Blazer, uh, clean pools. I thought there was a chlorine leak. It turned out to be the Holy Spirit just stirring in my heart. <laughs> I felt like I was floating or something, but um, I knew I got commissioned in that moment and my life began to change. But all throughout 2008, the Lord just began to work on my heart, and He was just changing things in me, introducing me to His love, and just so many things were broke down, so many bondages in me, self-hatred, uh, self-unforgiveness. I was able to break through that, discover my identity. And towards the end of 2008, uh, I just was laying at, in my bunk at the fire station one night, and all of a sudden, I heard the Lord speak to me, and he said, hey, I want you to start taking me with you on your emergency calls. And, you know, it was one of those moments that, wow, that's a novel idea. Why didn't I think of that before? You know, it's like, <laughs> but, you know, certain points in our lives, we're, we're ready to hear things that we weren't ready to hear months or days or even hours before. So um, the preparation that the Lord had brought me through earlier that year made me ready for that moment. I said, yeah, that's a good idea. I should be taking you with me on my emergency call. So I said, deal, Lord. I'm in. Let's do this. And so about 20 minutes later, the emergency calls or the emergency tones went off in the station and we jumped in the truck. It was just a report of a, a person who was feeling ill. And so it was just me and my partner taking the what we call the rescue. We'll call it an ambulance so that we can all be on the same page. But uh, so we were about a couple blocks away from the home and dispatch came back over the radio and said, yeah, so we this is going to be a cardiac arrest instead of an ill person. And pr prior to that, I was praying. I said, all right, Lord, this is, it's me and you on this one. It's go time. Let's do this. You know, this is going to be great. I'm praying for this person. Lord, I pray for this stranger that you, you heal their tummy ache, you know, and, and uh, make everything good. What is this uh, uh, hangnail? You know, let's get this going. I'm ready. And then they said it was a cardiac arrest. And I said, uh, this, uh, that's not what I signed up for, God. That's not what this was supposed to be. This was supposed to be a little warm-up. I was supposed to get some time just to ease myself into this. And uh, it wasn't turning out to be that. So, <laughs> But I just heard the soft voice of the Lord and said, just calm down and see what I can do. I want you to start praying against death. And my partner was driving, and so I looked at him kind of at the corner of my eye and like, that's sound crazy. I'm a healthcare professional. What am I doing? I can't pray for somebody to come back. How do you pray for a dead person? I didn't, I didn't know, but I just started binding the spirit of death and 
and kind of under my breath, you know, with fear and trepidation <laughs> and uh, commanding life to come back into the stranger. So we arrive at the house. The engine company is on the way for manpower. And I walk up to the door and we, we make our way back to the back room. And there's this middle-aged gentleman. He's lying on the floor. He's got his, he's got his feet up in the air and he's, he's cold and he's pale. And I reach down and there's no pulse. Uh, nobody witnessed it. And I said, okay, Lord, that's it. We're done. And my partner, he's, he's working uh, quickly to get out the, the heart monitor, but I'm thinking, no, this is, this is it. I felt a pulse, no pulse. He's not breathing. And, but the Lord broke through that. And he said, no, no, just calm down. I, I want you to see what I can do in this. I want you to continue to come against death and, and just release life back into this body. And I said, oh, you know, what do I have to lose now at this point? The guy's already dead. You know, what can, what can I, I can't make it worse. And so I said, all right, you know, in the, in the name of Jesus, I just bind the spirit of death and I release life back into this body. I command life to come into this body. And I reached down and, and we hadn't done any medical interventions yet. Things were moving very quickly, um, but we hadn't done any CPR. There had been nothing yet. I reached down and for, feel for a pulse and, and I, I couldn't believe it that there was a, a pulse in his neck that I felt against my fingers. And I look at my partner and I said, oh, he's got a pulse. And my partner said, no, he doesn't. And I said... No, he's got a pulse, I swear. And he put the heart monitor on the patient, and, and on the monitor, it showed a perfect heart rhythm. And I looked at my partner, and I said, don't touch him. Don't ruin it. <laughs> and he kind of took his hands. He's, he's like, we're, we're kind of in shock watching this. And, he's, and the guy starts breathing. And then he starts moaning. And then he starts trying to, to get up. And I'm trying to keep him down. I say, no, no, just, just wait a second. Let's all try to figure this out. And he said, no, I don't, I don't need to go to the hospital. I'm fine. I said, no, you, you're not. You were just dead. Uh, we're going to take you to the hospital. This is not going to be a debate. And so I loaded him up. And, and by the time we got him to the hospital, his vital signs were completely normal. He was, he was talking. He was saying he was fine. And I was kind of left to kind of process what had just happened. Uh, I, wasn't, I didn't think I was ready for something like that. I didn't feel ready for something like that. It just came upon me. That's why I said, you know, I wasn't looking for this. This is just something that the Lord took me into. Over the course of that year, I was continually introduced into situations like that. And I saw, you know, there were, there were situations and I, I had both. I had uh, resuscitations to where we were, we had done medical interventions and the person came back. And then there were those cases where there was nothing done and the person came back. So I had, I had them from colony and column A and column B. Um, but one thing sticks out the most was that, well, you know, even above and beyond uh, what I was what I was witnessing was that I was having a a success rate with uh, cardiac arrest coming back that I had never had before, and it, it was completely astounding. And so, out of that um, came a connection with Johnny Clark, who um, read something that I had wrote, uh, an excerpt from my book Life Resurrected. And he got in touch with me and, and put together, as the Lord led, a team of people who, uh, Tyler Johnson was one of those, so he was mentioned earlier tonight. And we got together and did the, the movie Dead Razor. And then a production company saw that and wanted to turn it into a reality show, which we began production on uh, March of this year. And it went on to Destination America and ended up being their most successful new show of the year. And so we are anxiously awaiting and uh, proud to give a brief, brief description of Project Afterlife. It's the criteria that we had to have. We had to have a person who was clinically dead. Uh, we had to have an other side experience. And we had to have somebody back in the, the what we'll call the realm of the living, I guess, who was praying for that person. So those were the three criteria. And we had 12 stories over six episodes. And it was, um, like I said, the best, the, uh, the highest rated new show on their channel uh, for the year. And so, yeah. That's what I'm still a fire, 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 fire paramedic. I have to go to on shift tomorrow morning. And so that's what, that's what we're doing right now. Well, Jesse, if I ever find myself in Florida and I have an emergency and I need a paramedic, I sure hope, <laughs> I sure hope they send you. So we are excited to, uh, you know, just be able to get a chance to, uh, you know, watch your show. Uh, if you go to, YouTube and type in Project Afterlife. It'll bring up some of the episodes. So be sure to check that out. It's a fascinating show. I really love it. And uh, I love the ministry that you just started as well. So thank you so much. That's very encouraging. And we love hearing those testimonies. You know, sometimes we're, we're not looking for things, but um, 
it just happens and and you know you roll with the moment so uh, I'm gonna bring aboard another speaker um, this is Michael Dingman and uh, Michael spent about eight months as a former volunteer at Bethel Healing Rooms in Redding, California. And uh, he now does d dream interpretation. He moves prophetically, uh, takes calls for prayer and deliverance. He's also got two books in the making. And uh, one is entitled Modern Day Acts, and the other is called Words of His Power. Uh, he was with a School of Supernatural Ministry for two years before coming to Bethel. Uh, he works part-time at a Christmas tree farm, and he uh, has been born again since he was 11 years old. Uh, Michael is a devout Christian. He's also raised the dead, and he was able to partner with God in order to resurrect a woman. Uh, she had died of alcohol poisoning and a drug overdose, and uh, so we're going to, again, make a link available if you want to stay connected to Michael. And Michael, I'm going to mute my mic, and it's all yours. Okay, uh, thank you, Cheryl. Uh, much appreciate this honor and privilege. Uh, um, like Cheryl said, uh, yeah, this uh, young Christian lady, about 30 years old, had uh, drank way too much and taken who knows how many pills to go with it. And uh, I was sent to this... Uh, ministry where they uh, gave people a chance to go from the streets, you know, into a regular Christian life, um, provided rooms. And uh, she was one of the people in one of these rooms in uh, this ministry. And I was sent there to help because they had problems, me and another brother. And uh, her neighbor lady came over and said, hey, Mike, you got to come quick. Um, this lady, she's in a real bad way. And so I go and I find her in this lady's room with a couple kids and dogs and stuff. And I tried to talk to her and she was, you know, slurring her words. And I could understand about one out of five words. And then there, the <laughs> her neighbor and the kids were trying to help. But I was just finding it more of a distraction than a help, unfortunately. And... Uh, <clears throat> So I was like, Lord, you know, what do you want to do? And uh, got the idea to ask her to come outside. There was a bench outside the, the building. And uh, then I could talk to her. And she agreed. And I kind of half carried her and half walked her outside. And she, um, you know, wasn't very stable. <laughs> Poor girl. And... Uh, but as soon as we sat down on the bench, she became like crystal clear and her words became clear and she became like instantly kind of sober. And uh, <clears throat> so then she's like, you know, like confessing to me, Mike, I've really messed up my life and I, I don't know what to do. And man, I really made a big mistake this time, you know, and uh, she says, what What can I do? I want to get back with the Lord. And so I, I tell her, uh, you know, the best I knew, I said, well, you must, uh, you know, confess to the Lord what you've done, you know, wrong or um, what you feel. And, uh, <clears throat> and he's faithful, you know, he's faithful to forgive. Uh, said that verse, uh, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And uh, so then uh, I said, uh, she said, I don't know how. So I said, okay, just, you know, repeat after me. And I said, just raise your hands and to the Lord and uh, just tell him, you know, you're sorry for all his sins he's done, mistakes you made, and just give your life, commit your life back to the Lord and he'll receive you. And, uh, you know, she did that, and she was very wholehearted and genuine about it. And as soon as she finished, you know, in Jesus' name, amen, um, she fell flat on the floor, or flat on the, <laughs> sorry, sidewalk. And I was like, Lord, do you take her serious? You know, <laughs> I was thinking, man, she just give up the ghost. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I didn't know what happened. And uh, so I went down beside her and. I felt for a pulse, had military training, you know, on her neck, and there was no pulse. <clears throat> and then I put my finger by her nose to see if she was breathing and there was no breath. And uh, 
so then um, I was like, no, Lord, this is wrong. She has kids. She's too young to die. You know, it's kind of just talking to the Lord, just seeing it as really wrong. He was giving me this, you know, strong feeling. This shouldn't be. And, uh, you know, and then uh, after I said everything to the Lord and, and I laid hands on her, you know, because um, lay hands on the sick, they shall be healed on her shoulders. And uh, <clears throat> then this overwhelming compassion of the Lord came into my heart and uh, whew, and I just started crying and weeping for her. And that lasted, I don't know, uh, five, maybe even 10 minutes. I'm not sure. And uh, <clears throat> then it felt like, uh, you know, just I didn't know what to do. Never done it before. <laughs> depending on the Holy Spirit, what to do. And it's like this boldness came up from the Holy Spirit from inside of me. And I just um, got from the Holy Spirit to uh, <clears throat> command the <laughs> spirit of death uh, to be gone from her. You know, Lord rebuke you in Jesus' name. And, whew, uh, and then I got from the Holy Spirit to command her spirit to come back into her body. Um, that's what it did. And then, oh, I'd say within a minute, maybe less, I saw her chest heave, you know, like a person that's been underwater for a long time and just getting that first breath. I was like, whoa, that's good, Lord. And uh, I felt for her pulse and she had a heartbeat again and, uh, you know, put my finger by her nose and she was breathing. And I was like, wow. And it was really powerful how I could feel God through the Holy Spirit moving through me as I commanded and prayed. And, and it was just, he just made her live. And uh, then shortly after that, the I guess the her neighbor friend had called the ambulance and the ambulance arrived and they uh, <clears throat> came and wheeled her in and took her to the hospital. And it was the next day, <laughs> happened to run into her pastor and uh, huh. and he just had come from the hospital, and he said, uh, Mike, I talked to her doctor, and he says, uh, even that next day, she shouldn't be alive because she still had too much poison of alcohol and drugs in her system to be alive. But she was. And uh, she lived and uh, <laughs> got to see her when she came out of the hospital, and her, her whole life changed, as you can imagine. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's my testimony, and thank you. Well, thank you, Michael. That was that was just a real blessing. You know, we may not know uh, all the stuff to do in the natural. We may not know C CPR and all the you know first aid things, but you knew how to get the job done. You partner with the Holy Spirit, and uh, you know you did what it took. So praise God. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony. Uh, I'm going to bring aboard uh, someone that. Many of you probably are already connected with through Facebook. You may be part of her, um, one of her two, or maybe in both, maybe even both of her Facebook groups. This is Melissa Glorioso. Uh, on January 3rd, 2012, Melissa raised her husband from the dead. Uh, like I said, she's the founder of two Facebook groups, Healing Testimonies and Divine Healing Prayer Requests. Uh, if you're not already connected, make sure you go there and join both of those groups. Uh, Melissa is the mother of four children. She's the grandmother of 13, and she effectively operates in divine healing. Uh, she's committed to equipping the saints for the work of the ministry. And in childlike faith, she's someone who's even stopped storms. So that's a fascinating subject as well. We may even have to do a class on that sometime. Uh, she <laughs> helps others transform their lives through prayer and renewing the mind. She accepted Christ at age 16, but it wasn't until later in life, like many of us, that she realized who she was in Christ. So I'm going to have Melissa uh, speak to you next. So I'm going to mute my mic. And Melissa, you can go ahead and unmute and just uh, jump in there whenever you're ready. All right. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you for that awesome introduction. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in 2012, uh, this was after going through Curry Blake's um, Devon, or, um, Dominion Bible Institute training. I had been listening to his uh, Bible school for probably about three months or so and was listening to three and four um, teachings a day. And 
one day I was at work, I was a couple hours out of town and my husband had called me and said that he needed help with directions on the freeway. And I thought to myself, well, honey, I'm in the middle of a huge meeting with all all these managers and, you know, just go ask somebody at a gas station and, and, you know, figure out where you're going because I have no idea where you're at. So I have no idea how to tell you where to go. So we hung up and then he called back a short time later and I was thinking, oh my gosh, honey, like just go to the gas station. I have no idea where you're at. I don't know how to help you. And I wasn't really cluing in that, you know, this was something spiritual. And so he finally got to his destination. He got home that night and I don't think we really talked about it too much, but all of a sudden he says, honey, can you pray for me? And I said, yeah, what's going on? He says, well, I'm really cold. And he hardly ever wears um, shirts with sleeves. And at this point in time, he had a sweatshirt on and a blanket over him. And I was like, oh, that's weird. So I just prayed for him almost nonchalantly because when, you know, we had been praying and seeing a lot of miracles. So when I prayed for him, I just expect it to be done. And we went to bed and um, didn't expect anything else except for that he was healed. Um, Then woke up in the middle of the night to a loud thump. And I kind of looked over in the bed and he wasn't there. And I was like, Tony, are you okay? And I heard him call from the bathroom or, you know, answer from the bathroom and say, yeah, I'm fine. And I thought, well, that was a pretty loud crash. So I better go see what's going on. So, um, I went into the bathroom and I was thinking, well, if he's up out of bed in the middle of the night and he says he's okay, he's probably on the toilet. So I should give him his privacy. So I'm trying to look around, see what this noise could be. And then I glanced over to where the toilet was and he was on the floor. I thought, oh, that's you, you know, (laughs) you were the loud thump. So I went in there and the most odd part about the whole situation was that he was laying on his side, but his head was in complete perfect alignment with his spine. So his head was not bent to the left, laying on the ground. And so his head is perfectly straight and he has pretty big shoulders. So it was way off the ground. And I was talking, I'm like, oh, are you okay? And we were talking, oh yeah, I'm fine. And I mean, he was acting like it was just, you know, middle of the day and we were just chatting. And it dawned on me, he doesn't even know he's laying down. And so I said, well, you know, and and I'm sitting there. It's so funny because I was sitting there trying to pull in all my, you know, medical training. I've been working in the hospital for years. I've had to take CPR every two years. And I couldn't come up with anything except, well, let him lay there for a couple minutes, get the blood circulating, and then sit him up. So I did that. I let him sit there a couple minutes. And then I sat him up, or he sat up against the door jam. And we talked a little bit more and and he still, I could tell, wasn't quite with it. And then he kind of looked off up to the corner and then his head fell down on his chest and he passed out. And I was like, oh, and then finally (laughs) it clued in. And yes, I'm a little blonde, but I clued in like, oh, this is a spiritual matter. And so I laid him down and it was really strange because... I remember he opened his eyes one more time, then they rolled back in his head. And I think that one of the peculiar parts about the whole thing that happened was that I did give him, I felt compelled to give him two chest compressions. But even after that, he didn't start breathing. And with all my medical training, I didn't check a pulse. I didn't check his breathing. But when I had asked God later, I was like, God, was he dead? Was he dead? God like asked me a question back and said, well, what happens when people die? And I said, well, people, you know, they exhale. That's the last thing they do. I was like, yeah, I remember him exhaling and just never inhaling. So, so he passed out. I'm assuming it was the second or third time his eyes were back in his head. And I just got mad. I was like, this is a spiritual battle. And I just got mad at the devil. And I just kept saying, Tony, in Jesus name, wake up. Tony, in Jesus' name, wake up. And I was screaming it. I mean, literally screaming it. And um, sorry, my husband's over here telling me how many minutes it was. <laughs> it, we, when we, we calculated the time that he got up and the time we went to bed, it probably was about 40 minutes that he was out. And um, But I kept yelling at him, and I did slap him a couple times because that's what I saw done on TV. So. Um, and I just kept commanding him to wake up. And the whole time, the devil's going, oh, you better call 911. You better call 911. And I'm thinking, call 911? What's 911 going to do for a spiritual matter? It was just so funny because that's just that was my mentality. And it was funny because I just recently heard Dan Muller say the same thing, that he had a situation. And 
people were telling him, you better call 911. And he's like, well, what's 911 going to do for a spiritual matter? So, um, yeah, so he finally woke up and he, the first words out of his mouth were, this is the best I felt all week. And I was, oh, I mean, at that point, I just kind of, oh, thank you, Jesus, 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 thank you, Jesus. That's all I could say, <laughs> because at that point, you know, it was like, we won the victory, it's done, and it's now it's like I'm going into a minor bit of shock, like, oh, I can't believe it, <laughs> it just happened. But um, so he finally stood up, and he looks in the mirror, and he says, wow, I'm really white. And I said, yeah, you're really white. I think you should go lay down. So we went back to bed and I kind of slept with my hand on his chest and my head on his shoulder and as if I was going to, you know, wake up if something happened. But um, we woke up about an hour late. We went to work and all day long I was calling him to see how he was doing. Excuse me. And um, and he, I could tell like by about three o'clock the afternoon, it sounded like he was just completely normal, like through the the whole morning times, like, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay. But then by afternoon, like, yeah, I'm okay. I was like, oh, there, you know, it was all bit, all completely back. But um, it was funny because all day long, Satan kept saying, you should have called 911. That's, that's not normal. You should call doc. You should went to the doctor. That's not normal all day long. That's not normal. That's not normal. And then finally I was like, you know what? You're right. That's not normal because we were never created to be normal. So <laughs> at this point, you know, after everything happened, we we're just like, wow, you know, Satan, you're so stupid. You just put a notch in our belt. But after everything happened, you know, like I said, I kept praying, saying, God, did he really die? And, you know, and God said, yeah, you know, when people die, they exile. That's the last thing they do. And I was like, yeah, you're right. I do remember that. And then Tony who's right here, yeah. even kept praying, God, what happened? Why did that happen? Well, I, I want to just tell a quick part that led up to all this. Um, so please indulge me for about three minutes here. Um, the whole thing started basically when I was 10 years old. I, I'll make this story real quick. When I was 10, my grandfather, by the same name, on January 2nd, the same day I passed out, passed out and died. Uh, three days after he passed out, um, that we buried him. And when I was lying in bed as a 10-year-old, um, this ghost came walking into my room and as, as clear as me looking at my wife right now, that's how clear this thing looked. This old man came walking up to me in the, my bedroom. I was scared out of my mind and he stood over my bed. I was calling out to my dad to come. And I said, dad, there's somebody in my room. And my dad, you know, being an old Italian guy said, I'll go back to sleep. He kind of ignored me. But I finally kept calling. There's a, there's an old man standing over me. And I didn't feel like I didn't feel comfortable at all with this this thing standing over me. So my dad comes rushing in the room finally, and this ghost like thing goes just right through my dad out the door. That was on January fifth. Well, go thirty years, uh, go thirteen years from then. My dad got diagnosed with cancer on January fifth. He died six months later, and all along fear. And this is why I want to make a point. Fear took over. So I thought by the time I'm fifty, I'm going to die. And because it's the devil will start messing with my mind and put this fear factor in my mind. So every November, December, before that January 2nd, I would start, the devil would try to get me sick with something. And then what happened about four years before I turned 50, that's the day my dad died. He died at 50 years old on January 2nd, or excuse me, my grandfather, January 2nd. Um, I would always try to, you know, the devil would try to get me sick. So finally, when I got Curry's message about four years before that 50th uh, year of my life, I said, there's no way I'm getting sick no more. That's a lie. So what happened that day when I was calling Melissa, I was getting really foggy on the freeway. I drove 22 miles in the wrong direction. I used to drop my granddaughter off, granddaughter off this one spot every other week to meet my daughter there. I got lost. I drove 22 miles out of the, in the wrong direction because my mind was so foggy. And I finally got her to her destination, got home. And that night when I woke up at 2.30 in the morning, I was in complete fog. When I was walking down the hallway into the bathroom, I felt like this thing jumped. I mean, it was like getting me in a chokehold, and it took me down. That's, I think that's why my neck was up off the floor, because I think I was in a chokehold. And I was out. I was gone for about 40 minutes, and I do remember speaking to what I would say was an angel. Um, and for about 40 minutes, I was speaking to this angel. And after about 40 minutes speaking to the angel, I heard my wife calling me. And I remember turning to this angel and saying, oh, I better go see what my wife wants. <laughs> you know, like I said, this normal conversation. And I woke up and saw my wife just yelling and screaming. And, and I finally came back to her. And basically, when I said I felt better than I felt all week, because that fear that I had felt 
about January 2nd when I turned because I was 50. It was January 2nd, and I dropped. I felt like that ghost that came to me when I was 10 was trying to put something on me, a fear, to kill me. And it's a long story, but I basically I asked the God later, said, what happened? He says, that angel kept you from going to heaven because of your wife's faith. Because he said, if you would have went to heaven, you wouldn't want to come back. And that's what I got from the Lord. And uh, hopefully that makes sense to you guys. But fear and the devil, when he puts fear on you, can kill you. And so that's why we need to come against fear and all the thoughts that the devil might put in our mind because it can kill you. But luckily I had my wife uh, there at that time. And uh, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be here. And uh, so I thank God for her knowing the word and knowing the truth. And uh, hopefully that hopefully that ministers to you guys about not letting fear get a hold of you. <laughs> yeah. And I'd like to give another just quick um, input on, you know, praying for the sick and stuff. Um, there was a time that I had gone camping with my daughter and we came home. We all took a nap and my granddaughter came in my room and said, Grandma, Grandma, Mommy can't move and she's crying. And I was like, what? And my first thought was my baby. You know, this is my youngest child. I thought my baby, like, you know, I wanted to get all emotional. And the Holy Spirit was like, no, you need to stop because your emotions aren't going to, you know, produce anything. So I know that when I was praying for Tony, I know the Holy Spirit really helped me because I wasn't emotional. I was just mad. Like, what? That was my first thought was, this is not going to happen like this. And I was just mad at the devil. I said, Tony, in Jesus' name, wake up. And I just kept screaming exactly that in that tone. It was my, my feet were set in stone. And this is the way it's going to happen. <clears throat> and it's really funny because we all, you know, God speaks this all in a different way. It's like even when I got saved, God said to me, Melissa, what do you want to do when you grow up? Be a professional cruiser? Now, if he said that to anybody else, it wouldn't make sense. So when somebody else sees something, you know, they might say something else. But when I saw Tony in that situation, mm -hmm. it was like, no, this is not going to happen like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we changed the course of the events through faith because God is amazing and the power is there. You know, it's just you have to trust in him and trust in his word and and know the word beyond all you hear, see, smell or feel. So. Well, Melissa, I just want to thank you and your husband for sharing your experiences. And uh, I also want to just thank you for creating, you know, community and a place for like-minded believers to go and learn and glean and, uh, you know, just get trained and equipped. So we appreciate you so much. Thank you for coming on tonight. We're going to shift gears for a moment. Uh, we want to ask some questions. Uh, I've got some some uh, pre-written questions because I wanted to make sure that we asked some really pointed questions that were going to help address, you know, some sacred cows that we might have as it pertains to dead raising, just, you know, kind of in the same line of thinking. Most of us, when we started getting interested in divine healing and, you know, trying to learn more about it, we had tons of sacred cows as it pertained to healing. And, uh, you know, if we study the subject of dead raising, it's really no different. You know, this is not something that we've ever learned about in depth on a Sunday morning service. So this is a perfect time and place to kind of explore those things a little bit further. I'm going to direct some of these questions towards specific people, and then some of them I'm just going to open up for anyone from our panel of um you know, believers, uh, speakers to uh, to address. So I want to kind of direct this first one um, toward Dan and Sarah Holman. And uh, I'm just going to ask the question, uh, is it always God's will to raise the dead? And if you have any scriptures that you want to put in there, that would be great too. So I'm just going to get out of your way and mute my mic. Don't forget to unmute. Okay, well, let's see. What can I say? I believe it's always God's will to raise the dead. Um, at least we've always responded that way. And um, I would say one of the things we've experienced by doing that is um, a lot of the obstacles you mentioned at the beginning, because we start out gung-ho, and then 
the obstacles are placed there in between. The family members don't want somebody prayed for or they don't want them raised from the dead. Or And, and we've heard all the stories, but really, I believe it's God's will to raise everyone from the dead. And I, I will qualify it with this. Um, Smith Wigglesworth, a long time ago, um, his wife Polly had died, and that was the first person he raised from the dead. And when she woke up, she looked at him and she said, Smith, what have you done? So I know there must have been something there where maybe it was not something that she wanted or had resolved on or whatever. But somewhere along the line... Um, I, I am sure there's something the Lord showed him about raising the dead, and that's why he saw such great results. But uh, that, that, that's what I would say about that. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your answer. Um, go ahead and mute your mic. And then I'm going to call on Don Lyle. And uh, Don, is um, Don, correct me if, I, if I've got it wrong. You're the Western Regional Manager for John G. Lake Ministries. Is that right? Well, I think that they call it regional servant, but it's whatever. Okay. So here's the question I've got for you, Don, and it kind of coincides with the one that I just asked Dan. Uh, what if the person doesn't want to be resurrected? What do you do with that? Well, uh, I can actually speak from very, very personal experience because the, the family that didn't want the resurrection was my brother. The one that was dead was my sister-in-law, and so I guess if we're gonna uh, if we're gonna talk about it, we got to actually talk from experience. And I uh, I only find in scripture to raise the dead. I see no scripture that says don't. Now I didn't shove it in his face, and I uh, you know I don't feel like I need to. Uh, because he's already in a broken state, there's no point in pushing the envelope. But he did give me time when she wasn't there. My wife and I both uh, uh, prayed to have her raised. It didn't happen, but that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop, and I'll never stop because Scripture isn't going to change. So all I can say is I'm I'm I don't want to hurt those that are surviving. Uh, that are having or in grief or are not spiritually developed to understand that God would do that. But I'm not going to disobey scripture for that. If that makes sense, what I just said. Yeah, absolutely. Let me kind of um, ask another question directed towards you also that kind of intertwines with that one. Uh, you know, let's say, for instance, that you know, you're dealing with a situation where the family does have objections toward that kind of thing. You know, maybe they know you and they know that you think and act and move in that kind of direction and they're uncomfortable with that. Uh, you know, their theology kind of goes off in a different direction. Um, but you know that it's God's will for that person to be raised and, you know, you know that ultimately the family would like them to live. So where do you go from there? I think I can be discreet and pray for the dead a million different ways. And I don't have to scream out to everyone that I'm going to, that I'm going to be commanding the, the dead to be raised. God is in hard of hearing. And I'm going to just, if he can, if he can raise the dead on a text, then I think there's other discreet ways that God can do it. If that's what, and I'm, there's only one position. He said, raise the dead. Now, I am going to not shove their face in it because if you've already got people imploding emotionally, there's no point in having to do a deliverance and a resurrection. Uh, but uh, like in the case with my brother, because that's what I would have had to do. But um, I'm still not going to disobey the word of God. I don't have to tell them that I did what I did. I, I didn't feel, I don't feel obligated I'm going to do, obey the word of God. I'm not going to bow to men, and I'm not going to bow in fear of man. If we fear God, then it'll, he'll work it out. 
but we don't have to be, I don't have to get a bullhorn to do it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate your answer. And uh, this next question, I'm just going to kind of open up for the entire speaking panel. Anybody who wants to take a stab at it, uh, we'll have, you know, up to maybe two or three of you answer if you want. Uh, or, you know, we'll just see what happens. And I don't know if anyone's going to really know the answer to this question because it's not something that we, you know, it's not like we see resurrections nearly as much as we see healings you know we're all still learning and growing this but is it is it common for a person who's resurrected to still need healed for instance let's say they they died because of a health concern and they were resurrected is it common for them to still have that health concern once they're resurrected and again I know it's kind of a catch-22 I don't know if anybody's gonna know the answer to that question but I'm just gonna throw it out there and if any of you would like to respond just one at a time go ahead and unmute your microphones and share your thoughts on the thing hi this is Frank Frank Hanks um, I have um, some personal knowledge about this topic um, my good friend, Pastor John Onekele from Nigeria, who's uh, raised many people from the dead. It's uh, happening quite regularly. When I was in Nigeria visiting him, uh, he was there to witness the time I went into the mortuary to play, pray for a lady and a man there. Uh, but he uh, counseled me and talked to me a little bit. He said, uh, he said, the number one rule when you approach somebody who's dead, he says, don't see them as dead, see them as just asleep. Don't let your mind say they're dead. Uh, the second thing he told me, he says, you want to believe God for the gift of faith, and you want to believe him for the gifts of healing, because you want to address the very thing that caused the death. And so he said, it's, it, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to pray for somebody who's died of cancer, for instance, and not deal with the cancer. So that was just counsel that he shared with me. So it's changed the way that I pray for the dead. I want to find out what uh, they died from, and I want to address it specifically in prayer uh, really in, in commanding it to go away or to, uh, like the case of the baby in India, pray for a new body part, a new heart, because the baby's heart had quit. So anyway, that's my thinking, and that's uh, some of the counsel I've received from Pastor John. Thank you so much, Frank. You know, um, John was one of our scheduled speakers for tonight, and we're um, probably going to see if we can get him on here. And we're going to offer this same training in January also. So, uh, you know, for whatever reason, we weren't able to pull him on tonight. But uh, I would love to hear from him. I know he's, he's uh, by the power of God, he's raised over 15 people from the dead. That's an amazing testimony. So thank you for your insights on that question. Are, are there any other speakers on our panel that would like to, uh, expound on that at all or give some thoughts? Yeah, yeah sure. It's Jesse. Um, the, some of the investigations that we had for Project Afterlife, we came across some, some uh, people who continue to have health problems after they were raised. Now, some of them, some of their health problems will take uh, in episode two. We had a gentleman who was in a, a head-on vehicle crash. He was in his pickup truck and, and he died on scene and was, was uh, resurrected by the prayers of his mother. When he woke up, he continued to spend the next several months in the hospital uh, healing from various injuries. Now, he experienced a lot of miraculous healings. One of His testimony is actually one of the most uh, miraculous that I've ever heard just because of all, first of all, you have the resurrection, but then you have all of his broken bones being healed in stages. That It, it was a miracle. It wasn't just natural healing. He experienced supernatural healings uh, continued. But um, we do still, we did still investigate some people who are still waiting for complete restoration, and and by faith we say that 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 will happen. But um, there were a handful of people that we investigated, and we got their stories for Project Afterlife that that they still had some some uh, deficits or um, uh, different um, different things that were still affecting their bodies from their experiences. And so, I mean, on the other hand, we've had people that we investigated who were completely healed. They, they were resurrected and there were no lingering effects. So 
I, it would be hard to stand on, on one side or the other, um, on that one. It's, it's there, there's people in both camps. So. Well, that was a great response. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask another question hey, now. Hey, Cheryl. Yes. This is Dave. Since I've been dead several times, I've had it work both ways. After the lightning strike, I came back whole. But when the bomb went off in my face when I was about 13, I was blind for a day and a half. And then Jesus walked into my room and I got new eyes. So I've seen it go both ways. Okay. Um, go ahead and hit your mic. Thank you, Dave, for um, for offering you know some more thoughts on that. You know, definitely someone who's been there, done that. Uh, you know, we love to be able to kind of learn and glean from your experiences as well. So thank you so much. Um, I'll direct this question again toward anyone in the panel who'd like to take a stab at it. And uh, you know, different people may have different thoughts on this one. And, uh, you know, again, that's okay. Um, how long should you minister resurrection to someone? I, I know uh, I've heard about, you know, Heidi Baker and her ministry team will, you know, spend maybe up to eight hours ministering to someone before they just kind of go before the Holy Spirit and reevaluate and, you know, try to, you know, get some insights of whether they should continue or um, so I don't know. Let's just hear some of your thoughts on that subject. How long should we minister to someone who has passed before we kind of, uh, you know, start planning a funeral? Anyone want to jump in there? Hi, this is Pena. Uh, I'll take this one. Um, Something that I learned through scriptures is, is that um, when we go into the situation, we go into it seeing it done. Like Jesus said in John 1930, it is done. It is finished. And um, also when Peter prayed for the lady that had died uh, in Acts 940, he it only took him half of the verse before she was raised. So if we go into it, uh, like someone said, don't look at them as dead. Don't agree with death. You know, go into it as a conqueror, victor. You know, you got the victory through Christ because the will of God is to raise everybody. He doesn't want them to perish. And some of them may not even know the Lord. And they really need to hear the gospel. So if we go into it from that perspective of we already have the victory because Christ gave it to us. Because it's him doing the raising of the dead. Like it says in uh, Acts 26, 8. You know, it's like he's the one doing it. We're just the vessels he's doing it through. So if we remove ourselves and we kind of accept the gift of faith because it is a gift and just walk in that because that is the will of God. And he did say, raise the dead. So that's it. We're agreeing with the will of God. So he honors that. So it shouldn't take eight hours to raise the dead. Uh, it, it took the Lord less than 20 minutes to completely reconstruct the body of a cat that was completely crushed. Uh, as a matter of fact, when he got up and walked away, uh, there was a bunch of body fluids left behind, but I know that the Lord replenished everything he needed. But anyway, that's my take on it. Thank you, Pen. Hey, um, hey, appreciate that. Go ahead and mute your mic. And then is there another that would like to, you know, give some thoughts on that same question? I would, Cheryl. This is Angie and Abel. He just went upstairs to go to bed, but I went and prayed, um, commanded my my aunt who passed away um, and at age 87 to come, you know, to raise her back from the dead. And as I went to go touch her, as soon as I touched her and I commanded her to get up and to wake up and I spoke life into her, um, this, this jolt, like it was the weirdest thing. I wish my husband would have stayed next to me. He, he felt something different than what I felt, but at the exact same moment. 
we were in the funeral home and as soon as I touched her and I commanded her to get up, there was this, um, almost like a time warp. I can't even describe the feeling I felt like if I wasn't like something moved through me and God said, she's welcomed into the kingdom. Like she's welcomed into the kingdom. Like it was over. And I just kind of looked around to see if anybody else felt that. And my husband was just staring at me with his eyes huge. He didn't hear anything. He just felt that energy like bounce, like come through us. And it was just amazing. And just that God told us that she's, she's home. Okay. All right. Um, one more question. And um, I'm going to, again, direct this toward our entire panel of speakers. Uh, looking back on your dead raising experiences, whether it resulted in a resurrection or maybe it didn't result in a resurrection, is there anything that you would have done differently This is Melissa, and no, because he woke up. <laughs> so we had victory, and um, I, I guess the only thing I would have done differently would be to hopefully recognize what was going on earlier in the day, because it didn't hit me until <clears throat> like he had passed out the second time, and then his eyes rolled back in his head. It was like, wait a minute, this is a spiritual attack. So I was a little slow to the draw there, but, um, no, the Holy spirit helped me and just was, I was just adamant and time stood still as I just kept doing the same thing over and over and over. And I was really grateful for the Holy spirit because I didn't once think this is, you know, as time went by, I didn't think, Oh, this isn't working. Should I speak in tongues? Oh, this isn't working. Should I do what Curry did? Should I do what somebody else did? You know, I never once thought that. I was so adamant, Tony, in Jesus' name, wake up. And that's the only thing I said repeatedly. And I didn't even think, oh, should I keep repeating this? It was just the Holy Spirit helped me so much. And I just um, am just grateful for God. He's just amazing. And he's always our help. Amen. Thank you so much, Melissa. Anyone else want to give some thoughts on that? Any of our speakers? Uh, this is Frank Hanks again. Um, I guess when I look back at what I would have done differently in some failed attempts, um, was, uh, I remember <clears throat> praying for the Chinese woman in the morgue. Um, I asked, uh, my interpreter to tell them I was her pastor because we had prayed for her, uh, aunt uh, a couple of days before when they brought her into the trauma center and she came crying to us and asked us to pray for her. So we did. So we had a connection. And so they told, she told the uh, morgue uh, director that I was this young woman's pastor and they, I wanted to get in with the body and pray for her. So they went into the morgue and they pulled the drawer out with the body and asked me if I wanted to have the head covered with the bag or just open it up. And I said, open it up, please. And so they were very kind, and they uh, just left me alone with the body. And I stayed there for about an hour. Um, in, my, in my heart, uh, I was just going through whatever I knew to say. I command life to come into this body. I, I rebuke death. Uh, I didn't know a lot at the time. Uh, so I just kind of kept up what I, what I knew, but at the same time <clears throat> in my mind, I noticed the natural things. One of the, one of which was how very cold the body was. And that kind of, I, I remember that, uh, uh, playing a trick on my mind going, well, how is this person going to come back to life when they're so cold? If you know, if if it was a different circumstances, I'd pull her out of the drawer, and I'd uh, try to bring her core temperature up and maybe try again. So I, in many ways, I began talking myself out of it. But I did stay in there a whole hour with the body. Uh, but uh, in retrospect. Uh, I would try to uh, put my brain out of the equation 
and and just start uh, just start commanding, <clears throat> and probably a little louder and a little bolder than I was. I was quite I was very quiet uh, because I'd never done this before in a hospital, and I I kind of had this uh, haunting. Uh, thought that, oh, you're going to be in trouble. Somebody's going to come and kick you out, maybe take you to jail. So I had these kinds of thoughts I was dealing with too. So I think uh, in retrospect, I would uh, I would fight off those feelings and just go for it. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Frank. Um, we've been going for about two hours now, and I... Um I don't want to keep our speakers too much longer because uh, I don't know if they have to work in the morning. This is a late night class, and I know for some of you it's already one o'clock in the morning. So, but I do want to give some of our guests, uh, some of our um, people that are attending the class, I want to give them a little bit of time to ask a few questions. So, is there anyone here uh, who would like to ask our panel of speakers a question? And you can direct it toward one specific speaker or you can also direct it toward the entire panel and just let whoever wants to answer it, answer it. Is there someone, if so, just unmute your mic and ask your question. I got a question. How many times did you attempt this before you had success? Uh, you know, who, who, who attempted it, you know, a lot of times before they finally got success? I, I'd like to answer that, at least from, from my perspective. Um, Din was really the, well, I guess I, I played a part in Bethany in that we were standing on the word of God from the time she was conceived. But um, as far as Dan was concerned, um, there was, how can I say, I was unrelenting with that. Um, and I, I didn't even know what I was dealing with as, you know, I, I guess I was, um, um, too dumb to know. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was really too dumb to know. I was, I was not backing up. I was not willing to give up. I wanted my husband well and, and I just went for it. Um, you know, I, I think the thing that um, we've had a couple different experiences with, with other people. We had one guy, I guess it was about a year and a half ago. Um, and, and this is, uh, this goes back to what I said earlier about what you say at the time of, you know, over the, over that person, there was a, a gentleman who was, um, he had liver cancer and the Lord, um, well, Dan actually was ministering to the guy. And as Dan was ministering to the guy, I wasn't going to say anything to him. And, um, cause I, I just didn't feel that, that I should. And, and all of a sudden the Lord started saying, Matthew eight seventeen, Matthew eight seventeen, Matthew eight seventeen. And so I was like, okay, I guess God's trying to get something through to me anyway. So I went went to Matthew eight seventeen, and it says himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. And, um, now this guy wasn't dead, but he was real, real, real close. And, um, so I went over to the guy, I handed his daughter a pen and I said, would you just hold this for me? And she looked at me like I had four heads and, um, and I, so, so I, I started to talk to the guy and I reached over and I said to the, the daughter, I said, can I have the pen back? And she's, she's like, what are you doing? And I said, um, I said, so I read the scripture and I said, um, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. I said, do you have the pen? Can you give me the pen? She goes, you have the pen. I said, I have it because I took it. And Jesus took your infirmities. He took your infirmities. He took your infirmities and bore your sicknesses. He took it. Jesus took it. Um, anyway, the guy received that, but he was in a weakened state 
that he needed his family. I wasn't able to stay. Dan wasn't able to stay. He was in a weakened state that he needed his family to stand with him. Anyway, um, so there was four of us that went together and three of us after, you know, we were done ministering to this guy and you could see that he, he had received what we had to say. We walked out and Dan took about 15 minutes to come out. And I'm like, what's going on? We have other places to go, other people to minister to. Well, his daughter grabbed a hold of Dan and wouldn't let go because she wanted to make funeral arrangements. I have to tell you, those words killed her father. It was a really, really sad situation, but it's so, so very important that you stay with the program. You stay with the word of God. Don't give up because Jesus, his, his broken body, his blood is backing you. But if you change your conversation, if you back down from the word of God, they will die. That's what I got to share. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so we'll ask one more question and then we'll start to wind things up. Is there one more person that has a question for our speakers? Sure, I do, Cheryl. Um, Nora here. Um, I wanted to ask any of the speakers if uh, when they were dead, were they out of their body and did they see everything that was going on? And um, were they able to know that they were coming back? This is Melissa. I can answer for Tony. Tony. He just jumped in the shower. But um, when he was out, he said that he was talking to somebody and he heard me calling him and he said, oh, that's my wife. I need to go see what she wants. Um, so that's he, he doesn't know who exactly he was talking to, um, but he did hear me calling, which I was more, you know, yelling, Tony, in Jesus' name, wake up. And at that point in time, he, he did wake up. Okay. Is there another speaker that would like to respond? I would. Yeah. I, I could share something, if you don't mind. When, sure. when, when I was out of my body, you know, I, I had a stroke, and I was not thinking clearly at all, but all of a sudden, I was looking down, and I was thinking about, well, what was my life insurance? Was my wife going to be taken care of? And so on. And I was thinking clearly for the first time in three three days. And, and I knew at that point that it was my decision whether I would go or whether I would stay. I knew it very clearly. And really, Sarah's conversation is what put me over and made me know I had to come back because I had somebody that would be in agreement with me and believe. So, uh, you know, I, I would say I was fully aware. Okay. And then I think there was one more person that jump, was going to jump in there. Yeah, this is Dave. Um, when I was about two, I, I went all the way to heaven and walked with Jesus. And it was so vast. It was like you knew all things. The scripture says in your spirit, you know all things. But when I come in my body, I was back to kid. Like, what just happened? And I was so young that I didn't realize it. But later on, when it happened again, the lightning bolt, like it was like you just got took off like a rocket. When you see the moon shots, that you went and seen your body like a helicopter and then it accelerated like, and then all of a sudden I was in another realm again. That happened to a degree in all four times. And, and yes, you can hear everybody, see everybody. And I didn't want to come back any, any of the times. That's why I have a hard time in this realm. Like how come, how come people can't get it? And, and, they, and a lot of people just can't hear what you're trying to say to them. Okay. okay. Thank you, Dave. So um, I want to thank 
our entire panel of speakers. You, uh, you've you really blessed us tonight. You know, it's not every day that we get to ask those kinds of questions, that we get to hear those kinds of testimonies. Um, and we're hoping that because of classes like this, that, that it will be every day that we get to hear those kinds of testimonies and talk to people who have raised the dead. So we just want you to know that we appreciate you and that you've gone a long way in equipping the saints in everything that you've shared with us tonight. So uh, I'm just going to pray for you real quick. And again, I want to encourage everyone who's listening, whether you're on the call tonight or whether you're listening through the link that we're going to make available, uh, I want to encourage you, go to their YouTube channels, go to their websites. Uh, you know, if they have books available, get your hands on those books uh, because these are people who genuinely love God and want to see the, the saints equipped and out there up and running with this stuff. Um, you know, donate to their ministries, bless them. If you've been blessed even in some small way tonight, um, you know, we just ask that you pay it forward and, and bless them. So um, I'm going to just close us out. Father, I thank you for the, um, the treat that we had tonight to be able to, uh, to sit at their feet and learn and glean from them. And we know that opportunities like this are going to happen at different times and places in our life. And we thank you that tonight is helping us to prepare for those moments. Not that we can ever fully prepare for something like that, but um, just call to re our remembrance everything that we learned tonight. Help us to move in that boldness and to just take it and own it. And uh, so we just love you, Lord. We honor you. We praise you. And um, I just ask your blessing to just fall upon all of our speakers tonight. Just radically bless them um, because they have radically blessed us. So we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, uh, Ron, hey, yes? Um, this is Mike Dingman. I would like, uh, if it'd be okay with you, to pray a prayer of impartation for all our listeners. Um, if they'd like to receive an impartation from the Lord to be enabled to raise the dead. Well, you know, one of the things that we do with our training at Inside Out Training and, training and Equipping School is, um, you know, we're not so much about impartation as we are about activation. And, uh, you know, activation is just helping to people to realize everything that's already in them so that they can, um, you know, just pull from that and just jump out there and begin to uh, to do the things that they already have the ability and capabilities to do. So, Father, I just praise you right now. I thank you, Lord God, that there's not one more thing that we have to ask for. There's not one more thing that you have to give us. There's not more one hoop that we have to jump through. We already have everything that we'll ever need to accomplish everything that you've ever asked us to do. And we're so thankful and we're so grateful for that tonight. And we just praise you, Lord God, that we can go out there and we can do the things that Jesus did. The greater works will we do. And we just honor you for that privileged position as your ambassadors tonight in Jesus name. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. And um, if you have a chance, jump in some of our other training classes. We have stuff going on all the time. Just uh, uh, take a look at Inside Out Training and Equipping School. Go to our events tab. It's chocked full of different classes at different days and time zones that are uh, friendly and accommodating to a global aud audience. And um, I'm going to have Ron go ahead and disconnect our call tonight. I want to thank Ron for setting up the call. I want to thank Olga for helping me to post some things over on the side of the side of the chat tonight. It just like I always tell uh, our uh, trainers, teamwork makes the dream work. So God bless you guys and have a wonderful night. Thank you, Cheryl. Good night. Thank you.